screen over there. And we are today, September 10th in Asia. Yep, the September creeping up on us. Jai Ganapati. Okay, see what we have. <clears throat> we didn't chat. Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahabiryam Karavavahai, Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu, Ma Bidvishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And our first topic, continuing climbing the ladder of consciousness. We are up to part four. In our last two Zoom satsangs, I presented the idea that human consciousness can be thought of as a ladder with 14 rungs. The lower rungs represent the lower states of consciousness and the higher rungs represent the higher states. The next line of these states is found in the Hindu system of the chakras. So just a quick review, I won't read them all. Seven principal chakras can be seen, cycle gives colorful multi-petaled wheels or lotuses along the spinal cord. The seven below are barely visible and instinctive. And they constitute lower hellish world called Naraka. So as we know in Gurudeva's teachings, Naraka, the Naraka Loka and the Deva Loka are both places as well as states of mind. States of mind we experience in the present moment. And those seven lower chakras range from the lowest of murder and malice, those individuals are usually in prison, up to fear and lust, which is the highest to go. <laughs> And the seven higher chakras range from the lowest of memory up to illumination and godliness. Better choice. And as we previously studied, Hindu teachings have two aspects, the intellectual concept and the actual experience. So we don't want to stop with our book learning We want to be able to understand it, get an A plus on a test. But if it's something we're supposed to experience, then we need to actually eventually experience it. And dancing is the example I usually use because everybody knows you can't become a good dancer just by reading books. <laughs> and they put their emphasis on practice versus studying books. And the first two Zoom satsangs on this subject presented the intellectual concepts about the ladder of consciousness. Today's presentation starts the second part, which is on the actual experience of moving up to a higher rung of consciousness. Well, before we talk about the higher ones, we we'll, wanted to mention about the two at the bottom. Murder and malice, absence of conscience. The lesson to be learned at this level is that actions have consequences. This is one of the functions of the criminal justice system. <clears throat> a few years ago, a segment on television described an innovative prison in California. By now, it's a couple of decades ago. As we all know, the usual approach is to regard jail simply as a time of punishment by confinement for a number of years. Under this approach, many of the prisoners released repeat the same crimes and return to jail again and again. Their behavior shows no improvement. In fact, they may learn the criminal's craft while serving their sentence, become a better criminal. In this innovative prison program, the warden had initiated a regimen that included counseling, yoga, and other therapeutic activities to improve the behavior of prisoners 
so they would not repeat their crimes and return to jail. The program was showing an excellent success rate. So the point there is, before we go on, didn't really fully make the point. <clears throat> we don't want to criticize people for their behavior. Oh, that's a very low-minded person. That's a criminal person. They're bad. I'm good. That's not the point. Everyone is a divine soul. It's just in some people, it's so covered up, you would think it wasn't there. But it's there, and society needs to look at them as needing improvement over multi-lives, multiple lifetimes. They need to come up. So in our thinking, we need to see them come up. Even terrorists, we need to see them eventually come up in consciousness, not just label them evil. When it comes to climbing the ladder of consciousness and experiencing higher states of consciousness, the general approach that modern teachers take is to focus on stimulating your higher chakras, perhaps in a shorter period as a weekend seminar. I read about one of those the Swami was visiting the island here. And it wasn't chakras, it was initiation. So Saturday was the class and Sunday was the initiation. And I think Monday he came to the temple. <laughs> I didn't see him. But, you know, we don't uh, support that approach. It's not traditional. It takes years to prepare for initiation or years to prepare for uh, climbing the ladder of the chakras. The covers of popular books on chakras on Amazon.com promote the idea that through meditation techniques given in the book, you can awaken your chakras and the kundalini. Develop your psychic abilities, clairvoyance, healing, and increase energy. Too good to be true, right? <clears throat> the illustration I generally use is filling a bathtub with water. Imagine that all of your spiritual practices add water to the tub and that the fuller the tub, the higher your state of consciousness. However, every time you have an episode of angry outbursts, it is equivalent to pulling out the plug which then causes all the water to drain out. Clearly, until anger is under control, higher consciousness cannot be sustained. So that's the point. We need to stop pulling the plug if that's what we're still doing. <clears throat> so Gary Davis' teachings differ from this modern approach of just focusing on the highest chakras and stimulating them. His approach is the first focus on closing off the seven lower chakras. That is certainly not as exciting a topic. And as I say in jest, won't sell as many seminar tickets, but is definitely what needs to be done first. Tirumandaram, verse 1444, places controlling anger at the first level of practice, which in Saiva Siddhanta is the Charyapada, and I'll try and read it. Say yikadai ne sa shiva pusa yame. Oh, let's see what, what it means. Tama lexicon defines seir as anger, rage, synonym, kopam. Thus, the literal translation of the line is adoration that displaces anger is Charya worship. So isn't that a nice image? One object displacing another. So here we have anger, here we have adoration, and we're gonna move in the adoration and displace the anger. I like it. And we have the longer explanatory translation. The worship of Shiva pertaining to the Charya path is to be with pure and spontaneous love, that's the adoration, which wards off anger, lust, and other such vices, and which renders fitness to the devotees to do services without expecting any benefit or reward. Oh, if we were to translate that into our <clears throat> terminology that we've been using, 
Tirumular is saying the Charya, Charya Pada is the Pada where we close off the lower chakras. How do we do that? Through awaking adoration for the deity. Oh, same idea as Gurudeva. Let's close off the lower chakras. That's what Charya is all about. We don't want to be doing yoga. In Living with Shiva Lesson 272, Gurudeva offers some important insights into closing off the lower chakras. Ahinsa, non-hurtfulness, is the essence of dharma, and the muladhara chakra sets the pattern of dharma. The muladhara chakra is a very interesting chakra because it is the base center of energy and consciousness. And consciousness is energy, ever creating, preserving, and absorbing. Karma is the self-perpetuating principle of cause and effect, shaping our experiences as a result of how we use our energies, mentally, verbally, or physically. So once we narrow down the individual awareness from freedom without responsibility, which is the lower nature, into the consciousness of freedom with responsibility, which is the higher nature, the individual awareness or consciousness must pass through the portals of the Muladhara Chakra and rest comfortably within the energies of its four petals. Four petals, of course, form a square, three-dimensionally two squares put together with a space between can well be defined as a box. This box is defined as Dharma. A box of Dharma, a red one. <laughs> Briefly, at this point on the path to enlightenment, we put our cumulative karmas into a box called Dharma. Once encased within Dharma, the various karmas may fight each other. As the individual progresses on the path, the box lightens and rises. The box of Dharma is the base from which the aspirant must live at this point. In other words, if we're not used to following Dharma, being free from anger and hurting others, etc. It's going to be a period of adjustment. Karmas are fighting each other. And then eventually it lightens up. I get used to it. Strictly contained, he may rise through the hole in the top of the box in consciousness or open a hole in the bottom of the box and seek freedom without responsibility in the world of darkness. To seek freedom in the chakras above is the San Marga. To seal off the hole at the bottom of the box is his sadhana, penitent tapas, japa, bhakti, and shiva thondu, all of which is eloquently explained in Merging with Shiva. Who holds the lid on the box? Community. Community pressures, both religious and secular. There are certain things that you can do and certain things that you can't do. Oh, that's the end of Great David's quote. Back to our box of Dharma, as we have mentioned at the beginning of the pub desk, climbing the ladder of consciousness. The core teaching of all the major religions is to provide guidance to human beings so that in pursuing their natural ambitions to achieve wealth and love, they do so in a manner that adheres to virtuous and dutiful living. In other words, all religions provide a means to live within the box of Dharma. As the first verse in Avayarvati Chuti states, as most of you know, Aram Seyu Virumbu, which translates desire to fulfill Dharma. Very important point, very simple idea. And it happens to begin with a short A, so it ended up as the first verse. I think the second one has to do with cooling anger, which is appropriate. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, that's uh, climbing the ladder of consciousness a bit short today. Some sections are long, others are short. And our second topic, continuing the series of looking at character qualities through the approach of positive psychology. As you know, they did their research, came up with six universal virtues, and they developed 24 character strengths, which are categorized into the six virtues. So each virtue has three to five 
character strengths, I believe. And there's our puppy, Lyrova, learning not to bark. <clears throat> Last week, we completed the study of the three character strengths and their virtue of justice, which are teamwork, fairness, leadership. And here's a summary of what was said before we move on. The virtue of justice is comprised of a commitment to contribute to the team's success. Teamwork, interesting. Teamwork's part of justice. Treating people justly, justly, not letting your personal feelings bias your decisions about others. Fairness. The ability to organize and encourage a group to get things done while maintaining good relations within the group, leadership. Moving on to the virtue of moderation, which has four character strengths. Forgiveness, modesty, prudence, and self-control. So in our character workbook, this is the one that we have a lot of. <laughs> moderation is an important part of Sagasiddhanta and the Charya Bada. First character strength is forgiveness. How would you define forgiveness? Forgiveness means to extend understanding towards those who have wronged or hurt us. It means to let go. In many cases, this is the letting go of some or all of the frustration, disappointment, resentment, or other painful feelings associated with an offense. Forgiveness and the related quality of mercy involve accepting the shortcomings, flaws, and imperfections of others and giving them a second or third chance. Nicely said. Reflection, take a moment to find an affirmation you could use to increase your forgiveness. <clears throat> Positive psychology suggestion. I forgive others when they are upset. Try me, try again. I forgive others when they upset me and or when they behave badly towards me and I use that information in my future relations with them. Learn from it. And based on research, suggested approaches, recall the hurt, emphasize as best you can. Recall the hurt, empathize as best you can. See the situation from the other's point of view. And do specific exercises. Take 20 minutes and write about the personal benefits that resulted from a negative incident, because you learn from it. Second exercise, think of someone who wronged you recently, put yourself in their shoes and try to understand their perspective. Third exercise, remember times when you offended someone and were forgiven, then extend this gift to others. Sounds like a turukara. Modesty this includes the idea of humility. How would you define modesty?
Okay, they define humility. Humility means accurately evaluating your accomplishments. It's easy to describe what humility is not. It is not bragging, not doing things in excess. Not seeking the spotlight, not drawing attention to yourself, not viewing yourself as more special or important than others. And take a moment to find an affirmation you could use to increase your modesty slash humility. Positive psychology suggestion. I see my strengths and talents, but I am humble. Not seeking to be the center of attention or to receive recognition. That's nice. And a suggested approach based on research. Our intervention experts recommend, one intervention expert recommends that we look for humility, modesty, exemplars among family, friends, philosophical lore, movies, or spiritual readings, then create a hall of humility. That is a listing of all those, all these findings and discuss how these learnings might be applied into daily life. So study other people. That's good. First exercise, resist showing off accomplishments for a week. <laughs> And notice the changes in your interpersonal relationships. Second exercise, notice if you speak more than others in a group situation. Third exercise, admit your mistakes and apologize even to those who are younger than you. Okay. Next. Character quality. Their character strength is prudence. How would you define prudence? Prudence means being careful about your choices, stopping and thinking before acting. It is a strength of restraint. When you are prudent, you are not taking unnecessary risks and not saying or doing things that you might later regret. It is often referred to as cautious wisdom, practical wisdom and practical reason. Reflection, take a moment to find an affirmation you could use to increase your prudence. Positive psychology suggestion. I act carefully and cautiously, looking to avoid unnecessary risks and planning with the future in mind. Suggested approach based on research, practice conducting cost and benefit analysis of problems. Write out the costs and benefits of taking a particular action and the costs and benefits of not doing that action, resulting in four quadrants. And specific exercises. Think twice before saying anything. Do this exercise at least 10 times a week and note its effects. Second exercise. Remove all extraneous distractions before you make your next three important decisions. Third exercise, visualize the consequences of your next decision in one, five, and 10 years time. That's a good one. The next character strength is self-control. Also called self-regulation. How would you define self-control? Self-control is a complex character strength. It has to do with controlling your appetites and emotions, 
and regulating what you do. Those high in self-control have a good level of confidence in their belief that they can be effective in what they pursue and are likely to achieve their goals. They are admired for their ability to control their reactions to disappointment and insecurities. Self-control helps keep a sense of balance, order, and progress in life. And see if you can create an affirmation, self-control. Positive psychology suggests I manage my feelings and actions and am disciplined and self-controlled. And research suggests, research has found that the best way to build this character strength is to exercise some area of discipline on a regular basis. Self-monitoring is one pathway. Consider a behavior one wishes to change. For example, eating more healthy, exercising more, managing finances better, and begin to track it with honest detail. For example, keeping a food diary or an exercise log. Continue to closely monitor the behavior while slowly making changes. <clears throat> and specific exercises. Next time you get upset, make a conscious effort to control your emotions and focus on positive attributes. Second exercise, set goals to improve your everyday living. For example, room cleaning, laundry, doing dishes, cleaning your desk. Make sure you complete the tasks. Third exercise, pay close attention to your biological clock. Do your most important tasks when you are most alert. Good advice. And that's all for today. Thank you very much. Oh.